It's my pleasure now to introduce this morning's keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin Kelly, the pun master. <laughs> you know Kevin and you, you've experienced his puns, but if you don't know him and have experienced them yet, look out. Um, Dr. Kevin Kelly works with colleges and universities as a consultant to address distance education, educational technology, and organizational challenges. He also teaches online courses in the Department of Equity, Leadership Studies, and Instructional Technologies at San Francisco State University, where he also previously served as the Online Teaching and Learning Manager. Kevin is a member of the ABLE Board of Directors and the ABLE Task Force on Digital Ethics in Portfolios. His books include Advancing Online Teaching, Going Alt AC, and the forthcoming Making Courses Flexible. And he's also just a really wonderful person overall. So Kevin, mm. welcome. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Give me one second. And thank you, Lakotan and Cheryl. It was um, striking. It was inspirational. Thank you for sharing all of that. And I think you'll find that there are many connections between what I'm going to say and what you shared with us in your summary. So the title, I wanted to be playful. As uh, Tracy mentioned, I like to take things seriously, but enough in life is serious that it's also okay to find humor in what we do. And so right now the world is changing so much and I look at who are some of the people who talk to us about how to adapt to change and Darwin came to mind. So because one of the themes of the conference is artificial intelligence, I said, what would Darwin make of artificial intelligence? What would he ask it? So that's the theme that'll drive through our conversation, but I didn't stop with Darwin. I also, um, as we talk about different themes, pulled some leaders, some people who have made some great contributions to uh, think about them as well. As Tracy did, I also wanna thank, start this uh, presentation with thanks. So thanks again to the First Nation that welcomes us here today. Thank you to Abel for taking a risk and having someone come up here and talk about who knows what. And also to Kwantlen Polytechnic University for hosting us. It's a beautiful facility, it's a beautiful space, and I will not be offended whatsoever if you take time to look at what's outside and feel that heartbeat uh, outside. Also, thanks to the sponsors, and I hope um, I speak only two words in Dutch, Dewey, and uh, the other one I can't say because we're being recorded, but uh, <laughs> Dream, is that how you pronounce it? Dream or Dream? dream. Okay, bring the dream. Uh, and then Pebble Pad, so thank you for helping us make this happen. And last but not least, uh, the elders brought it up, we are part of a community, and this community with Abel, you all are to be thanked as well, as well as our partners, ePortfolios Australia, where I'll be presenting uh, virtually in October, and then ePortfolios Ireland, where you brought up my name, Kevin Kelly, my mother's grandparents coming from there. That's uh, thinking of the origins of where we come from. I hope to get there and speak someday as well. I also like to put myself into context. And so, and it's a useful exercise for us as instructors to think about what gives us privilege so we can identify the blind spots of how we are not serving our students. And so I am a white male. For those of you who are not here today, you're watching the recording, maybe fuzzy because I'm in the front of the room. Um, I was not the first generation to go to college in my family. I was born in the United States. All of these things give me privilege. Some things that don't necessarily give me privilege when you look at that um, identity flower, some people call it, where you have look at all the different aspects of our intersectionality. I am a part-time lecturer, so I have a much different uh, experience at the university than my full-time colleagues at the staff or the faculty side. Sometimes it's tough just to get 
communication about important things like when grades are due. But these things are the trials that we, we bear because we want to serve our students. Also, um, why am I talking about equity? You may have seen that word in the title. And it's partly because of my work with students and the stories that they tell me help me understand where I can be doing a better job. As Lakotan brought up, I have made many mistakes, and so hopefully you all can learn from mine. Also, as Tracy mentioned, I'm a consultant, and I work with colleges and universities all around North America. And so I not only hear stories, but I also see data that tells me what things can be uh, identified as gaps, whether they be equity gaps or something else. So that's all just context to get us started. Now, uh, when I put this whole thing together, and I want to be sure you know that I did not use artificial intelligence to generate any of these slides. As a matter of fact, I memorized my speech to make sure that it would be mine and mine alone. So here goes. As an AI chatbot, I would recommend the following themes for your talk. Uh, no. So, as I mentioned before, we're in a time of great global change. And so I started looking around the world. This picture here is of California during its wildfires a couple years ago. And it's from space to give us a big picture. I was going to use the one from Canada. And it was this headline that went with that picture that scared me because they're using the plume of smoke from the wildfires from Canada to model thermonuclear uh, clouds moving around the Earth and changing the climate. I felt that was a little too heavy, so I stuck with the California ones. But when we think about the changes that are happening right now for us as educators and for people who work with young people, old people, everyone in the range, the changes that are taking place are generational, speaking to what Cheryl brought up early, earlier, making us aware of the generations, Technological, there's no doubt that things keep changing. Economic, emotional, environmental, political, social, the list could go on forever. And I'm only going to cover the first four, and if I run out of time, the first three or two. So let's think about what does generational change mean for us as educators? I want you to think about where you fall generationally on our chart here. Um, Right now, almost 80% of students in the United States, uh, higher education, are from what's called Generation Z. They're 26 years old or younger. Then we have a smattering of students, about 17%, who are Generation Y. They're between 27 and 42 years old. Then in Generation X and what's called the Boomer, and then there's a small, small percentage of what's called the Silent Generation that are older than that. But you can see the highlights when we look at the data for the instructors in the United States. There's a half million part-time instructors and about three quarters of a million of full-time instructors. And they're all in these Generation X and Boomer. So 60% of the instructors are teaching a large number of people two generations away. So what does that mean for us as educators when we think about that chain that series of who um, we're serving. It made me think when I saw these statistics of this, it was a random headline in CNN where they said, decoding Gen Z office speak. And so I watched the little video and it was very funny because it was four people who were Generation X interacting with one person who's Generation Z and peppering her with questions. What does it mean that I can text someone the word OK and you will feel concerned for my mental health, health and well-being? And it's how you write the word OK. It's OK with an exclamation point is, is fine. I, I feel that you're emotionally healthy. But if you just put OK with no period, no punctuation, no smiley face, then I'm worried for you. So that type of deconstruction of what's happening in the workspace as managers are learning how to work with younger people. Are we bringing that same sensibility and intentionality as we work with younger people in our classrooms, as we prepare e-portfolio assignments, as we give them feedback? 
And as we think, oh, I think it will be clever to put an emoji here to be you know, more um, in line with how they act and work. But even the emojis, if you just put the regular smiley face, again, they're going to be concerned. They, they need to see a variety of emojis, not the ones that we all grew up with. So thinking about perhaps, and this happens in Oakland, uh, California, where uh, I live across the bay, uh, and they often will have uh, co-creation of lexicons, dictionaries, thesaurus of slang for the students who come from a variety of cultures so that everyone understands everyone when they're giving each other feedback in their work. Also, not only do we need to think about the language, but we also have to think about the medium. So are we creating experiences that are mobile friendly when the Gen Z students are almost entirely mobile based? Last, like everyone, we want to get an answer to our questions in a reasonable amount of time. But the young generation now, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, really want to have a response quickly or they're going to be demotivated. They're going to drop out mentally. So are we giving them the feedback they need or giving them vehicles for feedback through peer review or something else in a timely fashion so that, that we can keep them engaged toward learning what they need to learn. Also want to call different generations into our minds. They were smaller percentages on that chart, but they're still there. And working with a community college system in another state, these two quotes from the written comments stood out to me. One, there are a lot of us older students in my classes, but we don't appear in the photos in any of your promotional materials. I don't get the feeling that you really want older students. That struck me as really both sad and powerful, and a, a message to all of us that we need to rethink how we behave in our work. Also, as an older neurodivergent student with ADHD, anxiety, and depression, I am constantly frustrated by how classes are set up for only neurotypical people who are fresh out of high school. These quotes, again, remind us who is in our classrooms. And so we need to think about that as we construct ePortfolio experiences for them to grow. As I mentioned throughout this talk, I'm going to be pulling on different leaders to help us think about our work through an AI prompt lens. So a Gen Z person that came to my mind immediately is Amanda Gordon, Gorman, sorry, uh, a fantastic poet laureate who spoke at the presidential inauguration of uh, President Biden. In a, she spoke with the National Education Association last year <clears throat> and said, I'm constantly learning new things from the great poets of the past and present. It's my hope to pay honor to those poets who use their pens to move mountains, such as Phyllis Wheatley, Langston Hughes, Audre Lorde, and Maya Angelou. They teach me to break boundaries with my voice. So the questions that she might ask, chat GPT, are whose shoulders do you stand on? <clears throat> and what do you stand for? So now we get to another type, another uh, series of changes that we've seen in the recent history, but we can see that those changes have actually in the technology sector been happening <clears throat> for a long time. So I picked just a few categories of technology that might be interesting to look at over time. Again, looking at those generations and what they experienced at certain periods of time. So all of these things kind of emerged at a time when people in these generations were alive. So for computers, People from the boomer generation and back <clears throat> um, were used to mainframe computers. I'm going to drink some water. They had to put those cards <clears throat> into the computer to make it work the way they wanted to. In my generation, Generation X, we finally got to the place where we could have a computer on our desktop. Generation Y was able to carry that thing around with them like I have here on this desk today. And then Generation Z and Generation Alpha, the newest generation, 
we're able to get even more portable and more powerful. The smaller the processing units, the more you can do with a smaller device. Similarly, if we look at video, we can move from film-based uh, projection all the way to now people can capture things and post them on the web from their phone without ever missing a beat. Um, because we're talking about artificial intelligence for this conference, some people may not know that Eliza, the first chatbot, was invented in the 50s, 1951, I think. The first auto um, AI-driven car actually was generated in the 70s. And then we get uh, intelligent tutoring. We get Siri popped up. And then we have, even though artificial intelligence has been around for a long time, we're hitting that part of the adoption curve where millions of people in one day went to ChatGPT to figure out what is this thing and how does it interact with my life. And we'll talk about the biases that are inherent in some of these artificial intelligence tools because of the information that they gather to give us our answers don't include the Kwantlen First Nation. They don't include a lot of elders, a lot of scholars, a lot of people whose voices need to be included. And those engines also don't cite their sources. So they are just giving us uh, basically the temperature of the ocean at this point <laughs> in space is how many degrees, but it doesn't take into account that heartbeat of all of the creatures that are within it. Last but not least, because this is able, I wanted to look at the portfolio timeline. And there's a great article by Orna Farrell, uh, who's from ePortfolios Ireland. Um, and she wrote an amazing article just a couple years ago uh, about the, the different um, iterations of portfolios getting back to collections of paper in a portfolio. The word actually means folder with, uh, that we carry. And then moving to, moved to its purpose being assessment, um, including multimedia, um, moving to what Tracy and our colleague Helen Chen deemed uh, folio thinking, and then now high impact practices. E-portfolios are considered something uh, that we need to keep moving forward. When we look at artificial intelligence, we need to look at, well, where are our students going? Goodness gracious. One moment while we experience technical difficulties. <laughs> <clears throat> There we go. We'll go back one. So when we think about artificial intelligence and have our students in mind, where are they going? What are they intending to do? And I like, uh, rather, a lot of people, when they're asking young people, hey, what do you want to be when you graduate? I don't like that question. I like, what do you want to do? How do you want to interact with the world? How do you want to change it? And so these are fields that are using AI right now for all these different purposes, whether it be image and video analysis. In medicine, I was thrilled to learn they're using it as a way to diagnose patients. And so I'm wondering, is there any check and balance there in case AI doesn't get it quite right? Um, process improvement, marketing and advertising, lots of reasons that people are using AI. And there's lots of fields that students are going to go into. So I know, and I'll talk about this later, that we have two ends of a spectrum of how we as educators feel about AI. And some people are excited by it. Some people are daunted by it. Some people in the middle are not quite sure what to think of it. But regardless of that, are we setting our students up for success in a world that's going to ask them to use these technologies? That AI chatbot in the 50s was also coupled with AI-driven robots on assembly lines. So it's been... 70 years since AI has been part of different uh, professions, and we need to make sure that we're not burying our heads in the sand when we think about um, 
AI in our roles as educators in higher ed. So then I asked myself, self, what, do, what skills would I need if I was going to go into one of those professions? And so the Young Entrepreneur Council um, answered the question for me. I didn't have to ask AI at all. And so this is what they recommend. Learn to code. Develop adaptability. Understand prompts and use cases. And I would argue in that area, rewriting prompts over and over because you refine the process. It's an iterative process, much like electronic portfolios. Cultivating a growth, cultivating a growth mindset, learning advanced research, using artificial intelligence to your advantage, investing in data literacy, developing emotional intelligence, building strong relationships. Again, what we heard from Cheryl and Lokotan today, and then engaging in problem solving. And so all of these skills, a lot of these sound a lot like what we do with electronic portfolios, right? And so how hard would it be to weave in some of these other things? So I, I brought up earlier, educators have a variety of reactions to artificial intelligence. And University of Southern California has put it into two camps right in their uh, instructor guidelines for the student use of generative AI at USC. It's either I'm in the discourage and detect camp or <laughs> the embrace and enhance camp. And that's the language straight from their document. I love it. And so I went out and said, well, what if I'm in that camp? I don't want my students to use AI. Well, how are some strategies, what are some strategies I can use to still engage them in the learning process and not worry so much? Look at all these things that, again, really sound like electronic portfolio practices. Assigning authentic assessments, formative assessments, and assessment add-ons. Having students submit media instead of essays, although with mid-journey, you might be able to get away with something. Requiring real-world connections to the students' lives. Having them interact with the world, come back and report. Incorporating planning and reflection activities. Using social learning tools, because right now, ChatGPT, I can't um, get it on Twitter, no matter how hard I try. And then using flipped learning, so that that in-person experience is focused on the activities that they're going to demonstrate that they have these skills and won't have access to the tools that might encourage them to maybe cut a couple corners. If you're in the embrace and enhance camp, then rewriting your learning objectives to support student understanding. I did this as an exercise. I took um, Tracy's niece, who's helping us with the front desk today, is interested in physics. And I went and found the most uh, let's just say, hard to understand physics learning outcome that I could find. And then I put it into ChatGPT and said, rewrite this for a first-generation college student who speaks English as another language. And it did a pretty good job of taking a really hard-to-understand learning outcome and make it something that when someone's reading a syllabus and has no background information whatsoever, that they would understand it. I, this is an exercise I had to do for myself before ChatPT was a thing, because my course is about metacognition. And in the early days, when I was <clears throat> younger, less gray hair, and, and a little more foolish, I had meta, uh, you know, used metacognitive strategies to improve your learning. And then I realized, well, that's great as an outcome, but they're not going to know what that means when they haven't taken the course yet. So I had to like use strategies to improve your learning and things like that. So. Also, summarizing and streamlining lengthy instructions. As you can tell, I don't mind talking, and I have lots of words to use. So when I write my instructions, I want to make sure that students, there's no stone unturned. They have everything they need to succeed for my assignment. That could be a little bit overwhelming. So now I've got this practice where I have these too long didn't read summary videos that are no longer than three minutes, and they help students understand what's the core out, uh, aspects of this assignment. What am I expected to do? And I can use ChatGPT to help me crunch down, I'll take away all the extra words. Also, creating conversations with your students where you're actively discussing how AI is a positive and a negative. And I actually did this with my students. I created a discussion forum 
in my class, which is called How to Learn with Your Mobile Device, and I asked them, what are the pros and cons of using artificial intelligence? And I was saying this at dinner last night. One of the things they said is, we definitely do not want teachers to use artificial intelligence to grade our papers. We're paying our tuition. The tax dollars are paying these instructors. They should be the ones grading my papers, not some artificial intelligence engine. They also, to my delight, thought that using artificial intelligence to game the system to write an essay for a student was not a good idea. They didn't like the fact that everyone else was working hard, trying to create something original that uh, showed that they understood the concepts and conveyed things in their personal own voice. And they didn't like the fact that other people were just able to go and put in a prompt and get an essay uh, that they could turn in and get just a good a grade. So how can we prepare students to use artificial intelligence at different levels. Earlier I showed the skills that they need to be successful with AI, but there are also some things that they can use AI to do. So I know people who created their own travel itineraries with ChatGPT. I know people who put together their exercise schedules with ChatGPT. So first and foremost, if students are looking for, hey, I don't quite understand this concept, it's a little, hard for me, is there anything else out there that I could review that would help me understand it better, a different voice, a different perspective? And I've actually done this because um, of my work. I looked at mobile learning, and I asked for mobile learning voices that are from non-dominant cultures. And I got a lot of great ideas from Peru, from all these places where I had not been exposed to their thinking, their research, their work, because I had asked ChatGPT to help me find people who are working on this. And I think it still could do a better job, but we can be doing that in our own classes to diversify the number of perspectives that we're sharing with our students, and we ask students to do the same. Also, we can help students become more self-directed by giving them strategies. Hey, break down a complex topic. At Pima Community College in Arizona, one of the students on a panel said that he took the ideas of quantum physics, the laws of thermodynamics, and he said, rewrite the laws of thermodynamics as if I were a 10-year-old. And so I tried this, and it broke it down and used ice cream as a metaphor, and it was a lot easier to understand. And then, now write it as if I'm a teenager. Now write it as if I'm a young person in college. Now write it as if I'm a 30-year-old person who's been working in the field. And so having those kind of scaffolded processes to explain really complex concepts, we can use this engine to our advantage uh, without having to do a whole lot of work ourselves. Students can also create their own study guides. They can get early feedback on work before they turn it in. They can practice assessments by generating their own quizzes and, and, and more. All right, so another type of change that I want to call our attention to is economic change and how it affects our learners. So you probably all have noticed that the world is different, and one group that uh, is treating it that way is uh, people hiring the students from our classrooms once they leave. We, we know that, at least in the United States, again, I tried to find data on Canada, Australia, and a lot of these things, it just was really hard, maybe because I wasn't using google.ca. I think that was probably the problem. But at least in the US, there, we're expecting a shortage of 11 million college-educated workers in the next few years. And in response, or maybe because they think it's a good idea, big corporations, Apple, Google, IBM, and the federal government are shifting their focus to hire people who have specific skills rather than having specific degrees. And that trend, they say, is only a drop in the bucket, but it is a, an indicator that things are changing. On the opposite side, Gen Z students who haven't gone to college yet are considering that they don't want a four-year degree. Under half are thinking about getting a four-year degree. 45% say they want a two-year degree, and 70% said no matter what experience I have in higher education, 
I want on-the-job training, internships, apprenticeships, so that I can learn the skills that I need so that when I graduate, I have, uh, I'm ready to go. And then from the pandemic, we also know, again, in the United States at least, that non-college educated workers were the most heavily impacted. Their jobs were the ones that stopped right away, put them on the front lines if they were a service worker or someone in an in a industry where they were interacting with the public. And so how do we support everyone to get to a level where they have a job when the world changes? As Lakotan brought up earlier, the p pandemic is not quite over and we don't know what's gonna happen next. Also, a lot of our students work. And when I first started at San Francisco State in 1999, uh, I was told that 80% of the students there worked at least part-time. So I was interested to see that the numbers are still pretty significant and at a national level. And I couldn't find for all students, but 74% of part-time students work. So they're splitting their time between learning and uh, working. And that's possibly why we're seeing that trend where it's taking students five or six or seven years to finish their degrees because they're spending part of their time earning the money to stay alive while they do it. 40% of full-time students work. And I'm one of those people, you probably saw that on my context page, that all through all of my uh, learning experiences, I had to work full-time while studying. And so uh, that uh, makes me at least able to empathize to some degree with the students who I know are working and try to find ways to be flexible in the way that I construct assignments knowing that they have these other obligations, not just work, Family, are they taking care of adults who need support? And so, and more. So I was able to find information on Canada and Australia for these, I was a little older, but 56% of undergraduate students work uh, while studying in Canada, and a third of them report that it has a negative impact on their learning. So what does that mean for us when we're trying to, again, construct learning experiences, e-portfolio assignments, and, uh, and more? that support students where they are. And then um, Australia is seeing a boom. Right now, they're at their highest since they started recording this information in 1981. 67.5% uh, of full-time students are, had a job in July of 2021. Now, I know they're on the southern hemisphere, and so July is actually not their summertime. It's during their courses, but um, that's, that's significant. One other aspect of the economic picture that I don't think we can forget is housing insecurity and homelessness. And so um, one of those stories, again, when I say that the things that motivate me to talk about equity and research it and do better, because I'm still learning, <laughs> trust me, um, was a, in one of my first years teaching a, a fully online course. It was back in the day where um, students could use all kinds of software to write their papers. So I had students using open document format and PDFs and RTFs and Word docs and all these things. And I couldn't open some of them because of, I just didn't have all of their programs. So I made this assignment saying, hey, um, I, you can use whatever you want to write your papers, but please just save it as a PDF. I think that's a function that you can do in any of them so that I can open your paper and give you feedback. And I immediately got an email back from one of my students. Um, sorry to say this, but this is hard. I'm living in my car right now, and I'm using my phone to take your class. Your class is called How to Learn with Your Mobile Device. So how do I create a PDF? of my essays. I'm like, I just created a barrier for my students. So I said, hey, you remember that email I just sent out? Forget it. <laughs> Use whatever you want, and I will figure it out. And for that particular student, I said, hey, if you feel safe, there's a 24-7 library that has a computer lab. And if you want to move your car from its parking spot, then um, you, know, you can do that. Or you can do it in Google Docs. And now I've gotten smarter, and the technology is caught up with me. Um, I have a Google Voice phone number that's free, so I don't give students my phone number, and he can write it on pen and paper and leave me a voicemail just reading his essay into the phone. And now it'll turn it into text for me, and I also um, just make it so that there's 
more pathways, universal design for learning, multiple pathways for students to show what they know. So these pictures are actually right on the perimeter of San Francisco State University. Because of the housing crisis in San Francisco, which is one of the most expensive housing markets in the country, we have literally lineups of cars, RVs, and other vehicles that people are living in. I don't pretend that all of them are students at San Francisco State because it's a space where those can congregate and not get towed or, or get tickets, but it is an indicator of that problem that happened when I was teaching in the early 2000s hasn't gone away. As a matter of fact, it's gotten worse. And so what does that mean? Well, the research shows by the Hope Center at Temple University there's a disproportionate impact on students of color. Instead of, I think it's the, well, three out of five students will experience housing insecurity at some point in their academic career. It's 75% plus for students of color. And then the negative impact on academic performance, just like we saw when students worked. And then it also affects their health and their well being. When we talk about, uh, grade school children, and if they're hungry, can they learn? Well, the same thing is true for college students. So food insecurity isn't on this slide, but it's another real thing. And then it increases anxiety, which means students aren't gonna do as well with assessment, with the time that they put into their learning. So I wanted to include it into these economic changes because it affects how we see our students and how we um, prepare them to succeed. And so um, because of his work around um, not only the pedagogy of the oppressed, but his use of a banking analogy for learning. I picked Paolo Freire for his uh, uh, writing artificial intelligence prompts, and I just wanted to pull out some of the things that he wrote. The more students work at storing the deposits entrusted to them, the less they develop the critical consciousness which would result from their intervention in the world as transformers of that world. And we want education to be transformational, not transactional, right? We don't want them to check off a box. We want them to prepare something and prepare themselves. Banking education treats students as objects of assistance. Problem posing, which we saw was one of the 10 skills for using artificial intelligence, education makes them critical thinkers. And so my limited brain came up with this question that Paolo might write. What problems should educators pose to their students in the face of so many daunting global challenges? How do we use those global changes as a driver for student learning? All right, one last category of change. I promise I didn't do the whole list. But I did wanna make sure we covered emotional change because again, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of anxiety. And so in a recent report, 44% of students reported symptoms of depression, 37% experienced some sort of anxiety disorder, 15% reported having seriously considered suicide. So this is the emotional state of our learners. We also know that the pandemic exacerbated that and we're coming out of that, but is the anxiety going down? I haven't seen that yet. And then, because the cost of education, the competing obligations, all those things are still there. And then more institutions on the flip side are offering support to help students address these things. And what I'm encouraging people to do is put it in your instructions for your assignments. Hey, do you need to know how to use the technology for this activity? Here's a little video tutorial. Is the number of points that this activity has attached to it causing you stress? Hey, here's the counseling and psychological services unit on our campus. They are open and available for you to just have a chat. And there are lots of other ways that colleges and universities are supporting students. Some through professional services where students can find a, a counselor 24-7. Um, in some cases, the really uh, thoughtful ones have specific counselors that talk to specific populations. So they'll have a counselor that can uh, help students who might identify as LGBTQ plus or um, 2S in Canada, second two spirits. Um, peer support, so not only uh, do they have platforms that allow students to get support from professionals, but they also have platforms where students can get help from each other. 
because that often is uh, a, a beneficial way for students to deal with the anxiety they face. And in some cases, how can they help themselves, whether it be through uh, breathing techniques, anxiety uh, reduction strategies, and more. Then also when we think of the emotional state, I also put into this that inclusion and belonging, because if we don't feel we belong, then there is a piece of us that's missing, right? And so I was having a conversation the other day with a community college district that was talking about accessibility, and one of the people in the room said, students with disability, when they hear diversity, equity, and inclusion, don't feel like they're part of the diversity, equity, inclusion conversations. Even though inclusion is meant to be inclusive, it's often limited to a narrow focus of maybe ethnicity or age or something else. And so again, thinking through the populations that we serve, and they're all smaller uh, percentages, but they are on our campuses, in our classrooms, virtual or physical, are we thinking about if they feel included and if they feel that they belong. And Verna Myers has a wonderful TED Talk if you haven't seen it. So how can we support students with that mental health, mental wellness? There are a number of uh, great resources that have popped up recently around trauma-informed pedagogy. Um, there are different wellness initiatives. Uh, I love the fact that during our online conference, we had space where Tracy led us through uh, a time just to reflect, not on the work, not on um, the conference itself, but on ourselves. Take time to breathe. Um, mental health apps and AI-based tools. When I have my students, how to learn with your mobile device, I have how do our bodies, our minds, and our networks affect our learning? And so under body and mind, I have apps that they can use either to help them come up with exercise plans, look at their diet, or um, engage in breathing techniques, stress reduction strategies when they're taking tests, and so on. And so um, these are all things that we can do as instructors to support our students without much extra work. And so because Brene Brown wrote the Atlas of the Heart and other works, she's so invested in researching emotions and vulnerability and other things, I asked myself, what would she ask if she were putting prompts into artificial intelligence? We humans have a tendency to define things by what they are not. This is especially true of our emotional experiences. How would you define vulnerability in terms of what it is not? I'd be interested to see Chat Beachy's response to that. And then college students are feeling a great deal of anxiety that affects their lives, their well-being, and their learning. What does support look like for those students according to those students? We can't just assume, we can't just ask ChatGPT, what can I do to help these students? We need to engage them. And my colleague at Fresno State goes further, not just reactive, but proactive, co-create with them. William Hardaway. So that brings us to what are some ways that we can engage in ePortfolio practices to address these global changes, help our students adapt to them, and use it to their advantage. These are not all the answers. I know you were hoping to come and learn everything you needed to know by the end of this session, but uh, you'll have to buy the book for that. Um, <laughs> So one is at Dublin City University, they've come up with age-friendly principles for their institution, and we can adapt some of those to our ePortfolio practices. There are 10 principles, but these five line up, again, strikingly well with ePortfolio practice. Encourage participation by the older students, and frankly, when I have older students in my class, they do a better job of shepherding the young ones. I had a 60-year-old online learner from England who was like, hey, you are not missing from my group. Everyone is participating, and that group was the most productive. Supporting personal and second career development, because some of our students may be going into their first careers, but others may be 
looking for a change, looking to um, upskill so they can get into a better pay bracket or what, whatever their goals are, how do we support students where they are in their own journey? Recognizing the range of the older adults' educational needs. So in some cases, they may not have been to school for a very long time. Um, they have many life experiences that they can bring to the table and share with the class, but they may have challenges with the technology or other things that uh, will not allow them to show what they know. The same way someone who speaks English as a second or third or fourth language needs to translate things and some things get lost in translation. We're not getting an accurate picture. So are we providing multiple pathways for these people to show what they know uh, so that we get a better picture of what they are doing? Also promoting intergenerational learning. And again, make it an active, intentional process. Ensuring a diversity of routes to participation. So how do we make sure that those learners are part of the process? Also, when we think about that economic side of things, that was largely generational. Here we can um, think about how can we encourage students to create portfolio pieces, maybe beyond our courses, that showcase what they're going to need as they bridge to career. And so right here in BC, British Columbia Institute of Technology, my former boss at San Francisco State came from BCIT and told us all about folio tech and all these projects. And it turns out that they're still doing great work there. And some students are taking it on themselves. This one in particular, in, uh, just a couple years ago, started his own video blog about his time in the aircraft maintenance engineering program that's 16 months long. And he walked everyone on the web through his experience and shared how he's gaining the skills to fixing wing assemblies and checking engines and things like that. What a great way to tell an employer that you're ready for the work that they have, and especially when there's a shortage of workers trained to do that work. My next door neighbor is a mechanic for United Airlines, and he said there's not a generation behind him. He's staying on and working longer because he, there are, aren't enough people to fill the slots. So how do we create more opportunities for our students to showcase the skills that they've gained in a way other than academic, in a way other than earning a grade or a degree? How do we encourage the students to become peer uh, feedback loops? And how do we take time in our classes to discuss what the employer needs are? It's not hard to look at um, the Bureau of Labor Management in the United States or something and see the reports of, hey, within a 50 or 100 mile radius of this campus, these are the hot jobs right now. And these are the skills you're learning in this class that apply to them. Redo your reflection. Keep the same ePortfolio artifact, but redo the reflection to highlight some of those things. Use the vocabulary from that Bureau of La Labor Management document to show employers that you understand why these skills are important. I talked about universal design for learning a couple times during this talk, but I want to encourage us to go beyond it. See it as a benchmark or a milestone as opposed to the end result that we wish. You, some of you may have been to the Peralta Online Equity Conference that I help uh, run every year. And during the 2021 conference, I talked about a model that I came up with that's a layer on top of UDL called the Design for Learning Equity that uses a similar format. And I liken it to going to the eye doctor. And when they put one lens down and then they put a second one, is it clearer now or fuzzier? Clearer, fuzzy. Same thing with this. We can talk about, hey, do we have multiple formats of our content? But we can also say, do we have multiple perspectives of our content? We can be looking at our teaching and learning through other lenses. Also, the California State University just this summer launched a new initiative that makes us think that universal design for learning is a milestone, but it's not everything. It doesn't support every student in the same way because it's a broad spectrum way to approach the problem. And so they've come up with um, strategies for advancing black student success and helping black students um, be um, everything that they want to be in life. Um, still got time. So a lot of us in the ePortfolio space 
use design thinking principles as a way to structure our assignments. And it makes a lot of sense. Empathize with the students who are in your class or the communities that they serve. Define uh, the problem, ideate or brainstorm, come up with a prototype, test it, implement. So this cycle is something that many of us in the room have heard or seen before. But how many of us have paired it with design justice principles, where you can use that design to sustain, heal, and empower the community as opposed to some other goal? Or um, are we looking for what already works so that we're not creating solutions where they're not wanted? And especially in our students' lives, we could be doing that with an assessment of their prior learning. We could be asking them to put artifacts in their portfolios that show they have these skills before we start our classes as a starting point. Also, engaging with the community. And again, our speakers at the beginning um, brought up that connection that we are all in this together. And so how do we do that in a way that respects um, our learners' backgrounds? And on the next slide, uh, we'll talk about, Tracy mentioned in my intro, that I'm on the Digital Ethics Task Force for ABLE. And we've been putting together these principles around digital ethics for e-portfolio use, but they really work for teaching and learning, period, right? And if we combine those with the social justice principles from the previous slide, there's a particular principle in there, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and decolonization, which is especially poignant because we have members of the Kwantlen First Nation here today. How do we include the community members as part of the learner's experience? Are we asking students to go back and check with people from their communities about what they're learning? An example from Laney College in Oakland, an instructor, instead of having students in her online course watch a video and write a summary showing they understood it, they watched that video with members of their family with their roommates, with members of the community, and then the student is responsible to facilitate a discussion of what that video means to them with respect to equity in healthcare or other issues that uh, everyone faces. And instead of writing a summary of the video, they're writing a summary of the conversation that they led about the video. And that imbues meaning for the student by connecting the course concepts with where they live and how they how they work. Making space for other knowledge traditions. A lot of our practices are Eurocentric, are their dominant culture specific. And so how do we make sure that we respect but don't demand that people pull in parts of those traditions that they um, feel would benefit them? Um, we hear a lot about digital storytelling as a technique. And we know that storytelling is a a tradition that spans multiple cultures. So how can we engage that in our, in our work? Also, reviewing the artifacts and reflections for the use of exclusive language. Getting students to be part of that co-creation process by making sure that they're aware of the language they use because when they leave our schools, they'll be bringing that language with them. So why not prepare them to use inclusive language while they're in a space to get that feedback? Last, um, thinking about that accessibility. Again, when I used FLIP heavily in my course, the first tutorial I had in the instructions for any assignment was how to edit the captions that are automatically generated for the videos. And also, we can lean on artificial intelligence again, helping learners identify what those meaningful artifacts are to create. So if we don't have conversations with our students about what the workforce is looking for, we can at least check in with ChatGPT real quick before class begins. And one a clever strategy from um, some people on the interwebs is have the ChatGPT come up with a pro argument and a con argument for a topic that you're gonna discuss in your class specifically about biases in your profession. Because again, 
We lack representation in our course materials, but sometimes we lack representation in professions. We see it with STEM, with women, with people of color. We see it in a variety of uh, areas. And so having those frank conversations with students about how they portray themselves, I know for a fact that at least students that I've worked with, some have chosen not to put their picture on their portfolios because they feel it will immediately inspire bias, whether or not it's intentional or not. Uh, and so how do we help students think about representation, about voice, so that they can own their voice and use it in ways that benefit them? So we'll close with how I started this talk, which is Charles Darwin, uh, again, talked a lot about adaptation to change. And there is at least one thread that says that he actually isn't the one who said it's not the strongest that survive, it's those that adapt to changes in their environment. So I'm a little worried now, but I've done the talk, so. It <laughs> but these are some questions that he actually hadn't answered by the time he passed away. Life on Earth is diverse and has evolved over time. How did it originate? Genetic traits are passed from parent to offspring. Describe how the mechanism of heredity works. I wonder what he would do and know if he knew about DNA and all the things that come with it. The concept of natural selection explains how existing species evolve, but how do new species arise? These would be interesting questions uh, that Darwin might ask ChatGPT, but what he could be asking today, or at least maybe if we took his spirit of adapting to change, how can today's higher ed students use ePortfolios to adapt to massive global change like the ones that I've described? So I'm gonna leave you with that thought prompt, talk amongst yourselves, and uh, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>